a todas e todos. Good morning, everyone. Who are attending this advanced workshop with the International Center for Health at Fiocruz 2022 edition? This is the 23rd seminar in this year, 2022, and it's an update on a review of the prospects in the area of global health and health diplomacy in the international scenario. This meeting, in addition to being a meeting by Chris Fuke, it is also by the Pan American Health Organization. It's also sponsored by the Latin American Alliance for Global Health, ALAZAG, and also of the Sustainable Health Equity Movement, CHEM. So these four organizations, and on behalf of them, I would like to greet all those who are attending us right now through YouTube in the Portuguese channel, Spanish channel, or English channel, because we have simultaneous translation and the YouTube channel uh, broadcasting these three languages separately. We have today a very important meeting because increasingly multilateralism in general and multilateralism in the area of health care, which traditionally materialized or organized in the space of the UN, and it has been so since 1940 five with the World Health Organization and the regional chapters of WHO, for instance, the Pan American Health Organization for the Americas. But increasingly, through the implications it has on the economy, society, and implications that economic and social issues have on health, health has broken the barrier of the debate only in the area of healthcare within the framework of the UN and healthcare, particularly after the COVID-19 pandemic, which started in January 2020, a very long pandemic, which hasn't finished yet. Maybe we are right now experiencing a fifth or fourth wave, depending on the country. Particularly after the pandemic, Healthcare broke this exclusive arm of multilateralism of the UN and occupies spaces even in the United Nations and the General Assembly, in the General Secretariat, and also in the Security Council at ECOSOG and the Human Rights Council. That is, health has become more and more important, not only due to the pandemic, but also because of other issues. For example, non, uh, cr chronic diseases, cancer, cardiovascular diseases that deeply affect life in society, work, productivity. So economic and social sectors become very concerned with the fact that they need healthy populations because of the contribution of healthy people to development. And we will only be able to have healthy populations if we have justice in development, if we have inclusive, equitable development that gives everyone the right to enjoy the goods produced by this development. This in the area of multilateralism, health and multilateralism. But multilateralism itself has also broken the barriers and has been breaking the barriers since 1945. The barriers of the United Nations system and different groups of countries were organized. In some cases, analysts call them clubs of countries. Of course, we rather call them groups of countries. Today, I will have with her four very important specialists, and they will be discussing four different clubs or groups of countries. G20, the group of the 20 uh, richest economies in the world, G7, the group of the seven wealthiest countries, 
in the world. BRICS, which brings together, as we all know, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, and South Africa. And there are many countries applying to join BRICS. And we will also be discussing the G77 group. This is a group that got organized many years ago within UNCTAD, on the conference on or UN conference on trade to work on the UN and also we will have a discussion here of the non-allied countries because there are many commonalities. So the discussion today will be on how health care has been developing in these different groups of countries. Not only what is what happened yesterday and what is happening today, but whether how health care has been evolving within these different groups of countries, considering that they too are embedded in a global complexity. These different groups of countries, they don't work independently, autonomously. They interact among different groups as they do at the level of the UN. They're showing us how complex negotiation, international negotiation is around health care. And this has economic, social, environmental impacts, political implications, and the political dimension is extremely important with the new agreements and disagreements. And all that right now in the second decade of the 21st century has become more complex with the war in Ukraine and the crisis of the global hegemony of the system that today is multipolar and increasingly it's becoming more bipolar, east, west, represented by more, more by China, India, China and Russia, and they too are part of BRICS. So this is all very complex. And we will be facing this complexity and we'll be discussing this complexity with four people who are well known in this field. The, well, we will have this meeting today because last week we had a summit of G20 presidents, the group of the 20 wealthiest countries in the world that was held in Bali, Indonesia that was anticipated, as we all know, by the G20 summit in Italy. And before that, I don't recall where it was held, but Paula will truly know. And we are joining a new phase of the G20, which is the so-called Southern Circuit. Because after Indonesia, South Africa, next year, Brazil in 2025, will have the presidency of the G20, Paulus Davis, who was invited to talk about G20. He's an expert on G20. He is a professor at the Institute for International Affairs at the Catholic University in Rio de Janeiro. It's almost a sister organization because we have been interacting in many different areas and we are really happy with that. We have learned a lot from this extraordinary group of investigators who have been doing research in international relationships. So Paulo Davis will be speaking as an expert in G20. He will be talking not only about the summit, but he will be talking about the trajectory of the G20 and also healthcare what has been happening in the last few years in the framework of the G20 and what are the prospects he sees for the next years. And later, I'll introduce the other colleagues who will be talking about the other groups of countries. Paulus Davis, I give you the floor now. You have 20 minutes. 
Thank you very much, Paulo. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank for the invitation. I would like to tell you that don't believe what Paulo talked about me. I don't really deserve all these credentials. Well, I'll try not to embarrass myself after all this kind introduction he made. So, no, let me first share my screen here. Please tell me if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. So I will be talking about G20, the health agenda, global health agenda, with a focus on the summit in Rome to Bali. And I'll be also talking about the health care agenda and how it is has it has been dealt with and the framework of G20. So this presentation is organized around three main questions. The first one, what is the place of global health care in G20? Secondly, how has this agenda been dealt with during the pandemic? And what are the prospects of this health agenda after the Bali summit? So first question, what is the place of the health, global health agenda in the G20? I would start by answering this into a straightforward fashion. So the health care agenda was not key in the agenda of the G20. This is due to the very nature and to the history of this group. This group was established in 1999. The prehistory of G20, so to say, started in 1999 with a meeting of finance ministers. And at that time, G20 had 18 countries, G7 plus 11 additional countries. So these 18 countries would send their finance ministers to a meeting that was held on an yearly basis in order to try to coordinate macroeconomic policies. This was the purpose of the G20 when it was first established in 1991, 1999, in 2008, G20 was upgraded, so to say. And from an invitation extended by President George W. Bush, the heads of state of 19 countries, plus a representative of the European Union met in Washington. And after that, these countries would meet every year on what we call today G20. So the first piece of data to think about G20, well, this is actually a group of 19 countries plus the EU. So we have Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, France, Germany, India, Indonesia, Italy, Japan, Mexico, Russia, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Korea, Turkey, UK, USA, and a representation of the European Commission. Additionally, in the group, we also have representatives of IMF and the World Bank. They participate in these meetings. The board of these organizations also relates to other instances of G20, but the presidents of IMF and the World Bank directly participate in the negotiations. What is common between 1999 and 2008? Well, the common thing is that in 1999 and 2008, we had two major international economic crises. And as you can see from the date of the process 
when G20 was established, G20 was a group made to face financial issues. So if we thought about the mandate for G20, if we had to describe the mandate of G20, we could think about a mandate which is described here, promote a debate and studies and review policies adopted by industrialized and emerging countries with the purpose of promoting international financial stability. So health care, except for the pandemic, most of the times was dealt with based on the economic implications and nothing related to right to health or human rights. Why? Because in the very DNA of G20, we have the issue of financial stability. And this DNA, even though the biotype, so to say, of G20 changed over time, its DNA, so to say, is still there. So this focus on the economic uh, debate is still present. So we have to uh, consider our expectations because of the very history of G20. This selection of countries, this selection of countries is a selection that takes into account, on the one hand, the need to bring together middle and high income countries, but at the same time, guarantee a kind of geopolitical balance and also a balance in the geographical distribution of these countries. So the different regions of the world are included. And at the same time, we have countries or a makeup that will not threaten the group that first established G20, and that was G7. And Paulo will be talking later about G7. So G20 was established by G7 at times of crisis when G7 realized that even though they caused the crisis, not necessarily they will be able to solve the crisis. So they have to call more players to join this discussion. And that's G20. G20 works through annual presidency. So every year we have a country that will be coordinated the G20 but this coordinator has a broad ability or has a power to influence the G20 agenda, even though in the case of G20, the power of presidency is decreased by the existence of what is called Troika. Troika is made up of the current president, by the previous president, and by the future presidency. Thus, we Try, they try to uh, guarantee, they try to guarantee a certain continuity in how the agenda is dealt with. So right now, Brazil is already part of the Troika because Indonesia has just passed the baton to India. India now has the presidency. Indonesia is part of the Troika because it was past president and Brazil is part of the Troika because Brazil will hold the future presidency. Additionally, G20 has an outreach mechanism that allows the presidencies, provided there is no veto from the other members, of inviting uh, countries that are neighboring countries or countries that are of interest of the countries that hold the presidency. So we have this outreach mechanism of G20. And with that, the presidency can invite other countries to participate as observers. As Paulo said, these groups of countries will coordinate the positions of the countries. The decisions made by these groups are not binding. At most, they have a power, a blaming shame power. Yeah, they may have a negative impact on uh, these countries, depending on their uh, position they adopt, but these decisions are not binding. So we 
hope that the commitments taken by these meetings, by these countries in the meetings, are complied with. But there are no mechanisms that really force the countries to do what they promised. And as a good student of political sciences, Robs told me that a pact without a spade is something that is just nonsense. So without mechanisms for enforcement, countries will not necessarily really do what they promised, or they will not necessarily do what they committed to during the G20 meetings. And finally, what is the major difference between G20 and G7? G7 is a hegemonic group, and G20, as I mentioned before, it is a kind of broadening of the representativeness in order to face a geopolitical reality, which is no longer the one that was in place when G7 was first established. And secondly, it is a meeting, since it has more representat representatives, enables to try to come up with answers or responses that are more effective to face current problems. We see that global health is not a central agenda. Historically, historically, it hasn't been a central agenda for G20. Let's see how this agenda was developed over time. And what we will see is that global health agenda until the COVID-19 pandemic was deployed in G20 after health crisis, as you will see in the survey by the University of Toronto. I hope you can see these figures. They are really quite small. If we look at the 2014 to 2019 debate, some years before the emergence of the pandemic in 2020, and this survey is by the University of Toronto. We, well, this number, 125, this is wrong. It's less than that. I think it's 80-something. 14, 18, 27, 40, 42, 75 commitments that by these countries uh, throughout these five years. So as you will notice, these five commitments are uh, largely concentrated around Ebola, first of all, antimicrobial resistance, that is the loss of resist antimicrobial resistance, which is a topic of G7. After all, it's been dealt with by G7 since the beginning of the year 2000. It's a topic that the European Union has as a priority and with the appearance of national systems, healthcare national systems, which has to do with the very agenda of the International Sanitation Regulation of 20, uh, 2001, so uh, 2021. So this is a topic that will frequently or, or usually uh, be present in the G20 agenda since well, as you can notice here, all the debates on global healthcare governance and even the debate on universal coverage, which will have a lot of weight in the G7, for example, it does not appear here in the G20, at least in these five years that are covered by this study by the University of Toronto. This allows us to, to notice that that first hypothesis of ours that the health care agenda was not a core uh, uh, agenda of, of the G20. And here you have the, because of crisis, and here we have, you have crisis. The presence of Ebola is clearly a reaction to a sanitary crisis that is emerging at this time. So. Out of the 90 commitments, one third has to do with one single sanitation uh, crisis. 
and the others are an agenda of the developed countries. Then we're faced around the following problem. Either the southern countries have not been able to include this in the agenda, have not in the G20. That's one, uh, one hypothesis. It's a hypothesis that will be proven or not. So this is the, not the Elizabeth Arden circuit, but it's the southern circuit when which we will be able to uh, deal with this topic and it will be a core topic in the g20 as well but the fact is as we can perceive by this distribution the health agenda is uh, not being uh, included in the g20 and the g20 agenda which is above all a financial agenda has been broadening, but for other reasons, other than health reasons, uh, financing of infrastructure, it has been enlarged or broadened into different re directions, especially the economic debate. But the health debate is one that has maintained, uh, has been left out of the G20, at least until the pandemic. Things will change, the scenario will change a bit during the pandemic. And we can think about the pandemic. We have Paulo Guedes with the V recovery that it goes down and then increases. This is the Paulo Guedes of the commercial uh, and the, pro the propaganda. But here we have the true Paulo Guedes that it goes up and then down. Why do I say that? Because we have three G20 cultures that will deal during, uh, that will be dealt with during the pandemic. The R Rome and Bali now in 2022. We'll notice that in Saudi Arabia, it will be characterized by a non-response based Basically, the health agenda appears in the Riyadh agenda, uh, declaration through the lens, almost exclusively through the lens of the pandemic. Other commitments will not be present, will not appear. There will not be any other commitments other than those related to the pandemic. And this is from the healthcare point of view. They we will see that they are concentrated around two topics, vaccines and reform of the global health governance. And besides, there is a, res a resistance, a reference to the antimicrobial resistance, as I, which, as I said, is an agenda that is replicated annually by the G7. Anyway, what we will notice is that there is a demand for vaccination on the one hand. On the other hand, there is a demand for the reform by the global governance mechanisms. But notice that we're here in 2020. And in 2020, the U.S. president was still Donald Trump. And we have a summit in Saudi Arabia. And when we make reference to the reform of the global health governance, we are uh, criticizing these uh, investigation panels, that is, the investigation panels that were uh, assessed that to assess the management of the WHO. And this environment is very much present in the resolution in Saudi Arabia, but the scenario changes completely in the summit, in the Rome summit. During the Italian presidency, not only will commitments be made, more robust commitments with regards to the pandemic and 
also with regards to global health in the final declaration, but also Italy will conduct what they call Global Health Summit, which is a meeting that will uh, gather leaders from the, from the G20, several players, and it will finally establish 16 principles from the very support and strengthening, but note, pay attention to the change of tone. If the debate on global governance in Saudi Arabia, Arabia is a tone that has uh, about the WHO procedures, well, actually, the Rome is completely different. By the way, Rome starts by saying support and strengthening of multilateral health architecture. It starts by pointing at a direction that is completely different from that which was present in the Riyadh declaration, G. Riyadh declaration. But notice that now we don't have the Trump, uh, we don't have Trump as the president anymore. Now we have Biden. So the declaration is addressed to, well, it's guided by completely different terms in the Global Health Summit. We may criticize them, but they are already a significant advancement as compared to the Riyadh Declaration. I will go over some of the principles that are in the Rome Declaration, but not all of them. To to save our time. As I said, strengthening of multilateral health architecture, to implement obedience measures adopted by the international regulation based on the One Health, and One Health after the Rome Conference becomes a topic that is fully present in the G20 agenda and the promotion of an approach throughout the society and health in all policies. So there are two approaches. The approach that takes into account health issues as something that is that demands an effort by all of the society and one that starts from the principle that health should be considered in the adoption of each and all and every public policy adopted by a country. The promotion of a multilateral trade system, which will allow for the supply chain in the health field, healthcare field, to have equitable access. And they have measures to detect response to the pandemic, strengthening of the national systems, uh, easiness of data sharing, and so forth. And finally, in the declaration, two very important points, which will talk to the DNA of the G20. And which are these points? The treatment of the need to strengthen and streamline sustainability and predictability of the mechanisms, of long-term mechanisms to prepare and respond to the pandemic and to pandemics. So there is an urgent need to increase the capacity to face pandemics. So there's a financial aspect that appear here in the end of the Rome Declaration that must be observed. And at the same time, the, the last principle, the guarantee of effective financial mechanisms to fight pandemics. This host of financial principles closed the declaration of the Global Health Summit in Rome, and it opens the way to the establishment of important mechanisms, which is a logic governed by the 
the area, the financial sector, the financial management of countries. And these are uh, established as of the declaration of the Global Health Summit. So it's a tool that uh, starting from Rome, starting from the summit in Rome, ministers meet sectorially. And for the first time now, we will have routine meetings between financial ministers and healthcare ministers. which is characteristic of international processes. That is, put your money where your mouth is, that old saying. So it is necessary to mobilize financial resources and bring to the table those the, the decision makers in the financial matters so that we can have some decisions that are relevant. Naturally, we need to suspect of the implementation capacity of these mechanisms. We don't know how much these promises have uh, been fulfilled. Few of them are, and we know the disaster that uh, began, social and humanitarian disaster that happened when the pandemic emerged. But this agenda of Rome is an agenda that will set up the debates in Indonesia, especially the debate on preparedness in response to pandemics and and debates about the, finan the, the financial mechanisms to face these pandemics. Therefore, if we look at the same exercise, if we do the same exercise that was done If we look at the same exercise that was done in the previous summits, if we look at Riyadh, Rome, and Bali, and you can notice here that I am taking the risk myself. I'm trying to follow the methodology adopted by Toronto. So the last three lines, well, Toronto has no responsibility about that, the Re University of Toronto. This was done with the best intentions on my part to try to provide some uh, a better understanding and try to enlighten the process, starting from the Osaka summit and taking into account the very dynamics of the pandemic. So you'll notice that in Riyadh, we'll have a concentration of vaccines and global governance. An agenda for preparedness and response to mechanism to, to pandemics starts to emerge already in Riyadh. It gains more volume in Rome, and there are already three commitments on this agenda, but there's also a financial commitment, a host of financial commitments regarding this agenda. But you will notice that the agenda in Rome, not only the absolute number of commitments that goes from 10 to 19 in healthcare, not only this, will this number increase, but also the scope will increase of the Rome Declaration. You already, we already start to see the One Health approach, the problem that appeared in the Bali summit, that is workforce in healthcare, the lack of workforce in healthcare, and these are already included in the Rome agenda, and Indonesia will inherit this agenda and will give emphasis to two dimensions. Also in Rome, there is an access to vaccines. It's something that undergoes enormous pressure by civil society with some success in the case of Rome, but which will appear now sort of uh, out a little out of breath, so to speak, in the case of Indonesia. So the commitments will have to do with 
preparedness and response mechanisms to pandemics and two financial mechanisms that have to do with the most important element that is created starting in the Bali summit. That is the financial intermediary fund to prepare and to respond to pandemics. This fund is created by the G20 under the umbrella of the World Bank in this uh, fifth structure, financial intermediary, intermediary fund is something that the World Bank adopts for uh, different purposes. And now one such fund was created for the preparedness and response to pandemics. So the request of financial donations which was done in the beginning of the creation process of this thumb was about was of about 10.5 billion dollars and the fund managed to reach 1.4 billion dollars last week and now it's i think it's at 1.6 so we still lack 85 percent of the resources that are considered necessary to begin a work of preparedness and response to pandemics. So, loss and damage fund was created for the, in the COP, in the COP, because there is a lack of financing. And this problem uh, crosses the G20. That is, the G20 was created as a as an increase of the G7 table, bringing average income countries to the table, making these countries not only participate in the necessary decisions to overcome financial crisis, but also to participate financially. So the intention of the G7 when they bring average income countries into the G7 is for, for these countries to begin to contribute financially. So there is a logic, there is a differentiation between development developing and developed countries. So the developed countries obviously uh, have more of a participation. Well, actually, I, developed countries are developed because they have a colonial uh, past that ensures conditions for them to take developed countries' positions at this point. And this scheme is revealed clearly in what we understand as social assistance to development. It's, uh, it divides the world into donors and recipients. So they do not want to pay this bill on themselves. They want to rediscuss responsibilities. This is what is being discussed right now. And the fund can only get 1.5 or 1.6 billion US dollars within 10 or 11 billion dollars that are needed. They will get only 15%. Only 15% will be raised because developed countries are waiting to see what will the contribution to be given by developing countries. By developing countries, understand China developing countries. Sorry, Regina, but every time developed countries refer to developing countries, so they actually mean China because they want the contribution of China. This is what they want. So the fund is not doing anything right now, just waiting to see what the contribution of developing countries will be I would say that the debate on development and global health is not going on right now because we have to talk about the issue of differentiation between developed and developing countries. Just coming to the end now, 
to think of the future of this health agenda in the framework of G20. I think that the future of this agenda or of this agenda may thrive in G20 through the financial bias. And through the financial bias, this healthcare agenda may prosper if we once again talk about the issue of differentiation. I'm not advocating that we adopt the position advocated by the Europeans that everybody should pay the same thing. Europeans talk about a kind of regressive uh, tax. We may think about a taxation mechanism that is progressive. Brazil, the Brazilian government, in 2013, through Isabella Teixeira, the minister, they put together a proposal at COP held in Peru in 2013. And the proposal was that we should work on the differentiation of responsibility based on concentric circles. It's not possible for Brazil, it is not possible for China, because these are middle to high income countries that we continue to date just saying that we have no responsibility regarding provision of things such as health care or stable climate. We have to take international responsibilities. The only issue is that our responsibilities cannot be the same responsibilities of those countries that were colonized, colonizers. These developed countries have a responsibility which is not only for the set of abilities that they have, which is much greater than the abilities of middle income countries, but also because of how these abilities were historically built. Therefore, developed countries have a greater responsibility than middle income countries. But the urgent need to discuss the responsibilities of middle income countries is here. And we have to have this discussion to unlock the funding mechanisms for development. As we have in some arenas of discussion, for example, G20, unlock the financial intermediary fund means also to unlock since, again, as I learned in Minas Gerais, it means to unlock the whole discussion on pandemic preparedness and response mechanisms, which in turn will enable us to discuss governance mechanisms reform, because middle income countries, they want to have a greater voice and they want to have a greater status in the decision-making arenas for world government, be it at the Security Council, as Luis Inácio Lula da Silva declared at COP, be it in other arenas such as IMF and World Bank, so that these countries strengthen their claim and so that they can have a more weight in decisions they too have to take a set of international responsibilities. I really advocate South-South cooperation, but this is my position. I refuse to consider that Brazil and Mozambique occupy the same place or have the same ability. The fact that we have a greater Capacity means that we should have more responsibility too. And this responsibility is not the same as developed countries, but Brazil has to take responsibilities. And that means to have a sort of commitment regarding this financial intermediary fund for pandemic preparedness and response. Thank you very much. I really exceeded my time. Sorry about that. But I let you go on because I think that you really had a great presentation. I'm sure that people will agree with me. I think that you have delivered one of the most thorough lectures on G20, particularly in terms of health. I'm saying that, Paula, not because I admire you or because we are friends, because really, your presentation was really brilliant. 
And I'd like to say that in 2023, we will have a new book by Chris and translating your presentation into words, into written words on a piece of paper or in a word file. So we have a chapter that is already ready, a chapter on health and G20. I learned a lot. All these uh, connections you made, talk about the history of G20 from the Osaka summit, uh, and also talk about Riyadh, which I had forgot, Riyadh, Rome, and now Bali, and also the perspectives. I think that for our students who are attending this meeting, for the whole audience. I think that was a great lecture indeed. Thank you very, very much for your contribution. This has been recorded. I suggest that you watch it many times so that when you are again invited to talk about health and G20, you do again what you've just done now. I know you are in Berlin. You are speaking from a capital city of one of the most important G20 uh, countries, even though they were beaten by the Japanese team yesterday. You've probably put a little Brazilian flag on your apartment saying this is because of the World Cup, but putting the Brazilian flag to remind Germans that, you know, that, well, just something I have to say, Paulo. As the father of a German daughter, yesterday for the first time, I felt that I was proud of Germany. That was the best picture. They put in their hands on their mouth. The, the 21 book is coming out yesterday, so they changed the picture because Chris, journalism is really agile. They've replaced the picture by this picture of the whole German team putting the hands on their mouths. I don't didn't want to put the picture of the foreign affairs uh, minister with the prince. That was, we didn't have enough space for both pictures. Thank you very much, Paulo. I think now Pedro Brooker, who was provoked by you many times, Pedro is the vice coordinator of CRIS. He's in charge, together with Paulo Esteve, for the chapter on G20, G7. In this uh, journal that is really outstanding, this chapter was written because of the G20 summit, but Pedro will also talk about how health was discussed in G7, considering the Cornwall meeting held last year and uh, the meeting in the Swiss Alps this year. You know, they're very fancy, you know. It is the coast of the UK or in the German Alps. Well, there's no tropical country in the G7, there are no palm uh, beaches in G7. So, Pedro, the floor is yours. You have 20 minutes. Thank you, Paulo. That's a great opportunity to talk about these issues. It's really nice to talk about uh, after Esteves and this work we have been doing together. Chris, even looking at G7, G20. But today I will focus on G7, which has this history that is very much related to G20. So, please let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can, Pedro. So, so I think I have to unshare because I cannot forward my slides. So I'll share my screen again. Ah, 
Agora sim, de novo, já podem ver em tela cheia. Can you see the screen now? Sim, sim. Perfeito. Então a gente vai falar sobre saúde do G7, né? De so I'll be talking about health and G7. Focando nesse período aí já da... Focusing on the spirit of the COVID-19 pandemic. That's a picture showing, as Paulo said, the summit that was held in the in the German Bavarian Alps in a very healthy environment, everybody with a pleasant face, even though they're held in the summit at a very harsh time. And G7 was really uh, fighting, so to say, Russia because of the Ukraine war. Our main purpose here is to present or talk about how G7, particularly in the past year under the German presidency, has been working on the health issue and a secondary uh, goals. I'll just show you a brief history of the G7 relating health with the commitments made in the previous summit, which was held in the UK in 2021. And we will look at the evolution of health in 2022, also related to climate themes, which is an important theme discussed at G7, which is related to health and also Ukraine war, that also has some connections and which actually became the main thing or main theme dealt with by G7. And the foundation of this discussion is on the studies performed by the Observatory of Health, uh, Global Health and Health Diplomacy which have been following G7 and G20, and also OCD, which is the Social and Economic Cooperation Organization. So this is a brief history. The first G7 meeting, G7 emerged as G20 in the 1970s at a time of bipolarity in the world. We had the 1970s crisis, we no longer had this parity between US dollar and gold leading to the first oil crisis. Not only that, but one of the reasons for the first oil crisis, and then in 1975, there was a first G7 summit without Canada to try to deal with the situation. Next year, 1976, in Canada, the first full G7 meeting held in Puerto Rico which belongs to the US, it has a certain autonomy, but, and that was to deal with a serious economic financial crisis coming from the first oil shock, which happened in 1973. And after that, every year, the seven main Western economies of the world, well, we used to say that these are the seven largest economies in the world, but they are not, they have never been at that time. There was the Soviet Union, and even today, we know that these are not the seven largest economies in the world, but they are the main capitalist uh, economies in this bipolar world, or the main economies of the Western world, between quotation marks, because we have Japan, which become, belongs to the East, but which has been strongly aligned to the USA and Western Europe. A timeline. We have the beginning of G7 as a response to the first oil crisis in 1975-76, as Paulo Steve mentioned regarding G20. G7 deals with economic financial issues. This is part of their DNA, responding to economic crisis and coordinating of the actions of these countries to respond to economic financial crisis. They started playing a very relevant role in another milestone is late 1990s, between 97 and the year 2000, we had the end of this bipolarity, the end of the Cold War, apparently. Until then, maybe we are returning to a new version of the Cold War, hopefully not, but this is going on right now, and the integration of Russia in terms of economic coordination of the main powers. So Russia was invited and it started being called G7 plus one or 
G7 plus Russia, and then it started being called G8 with the introduction of Russia. And some important meetings were held to respond to this economic crisis in the late 1990s. And Paul Steve has mentioned, we have there the origins of G20 with the end of this Cold War, G7 economies want more le legitimacy, expanding their legitimacy and also share the weight of the response to be given. And also, another milestone is the Millennium Summit establishing the Millennium Development Goals. So, goals to advance in all themes, for instance, global health, environment, particularly in all different areas, education and so on. Again, in the end, of, well, from 2000 to 2010, we had other financial crisis, subprime crisis, the bank crisis in the G7 uh, countries. And now G20 plays a major role. So crisis started in G7 countries and G7 countries said they could not respond on their own. They had to resort to G20 and also emergence of BRICS. EBUS is from the beginning of that decade and it becomes BRICS at the end of that decade. And at its origin, EBUS is a counterpoint to G7 and this may happen with BRICS also of being a group of countries, which is smaller. We know that there is a much bigger group. Regina will be talking about later, G77. And then we have a smaller uh, group, the idea of BRICS, particularly when uh, South Africa joined the group. Then we had another important milestone, 2014-15. There we had the first Ukraine crisis with a change in government and Russia annexing Crimea, and then it's expelled from G8. So it again becomes G7. And at that time, the 2030 agenda was established. And this has all always to be mentioned and worked on by G7 countries. Finally, in this 20. 2020-2022, the past three years with this major pandemic, the largest in the next last 100 years. And as Paulo Esteves said, health is not the main topic of G7, just like it's not the, uh, in the G20, but now again it, it gains uh, the highlights. And now in 2022, with the Ukraine war comes and takes the focus of the G7 scope, uh, leaving health and climate in second place. Here we have a very interesting illustration that takes these, t these three groups, G7, then with Russia, the G8, and the G20, you see all the member countries. The G7, actually, North America and Europe, and Japan, the ally from the East. And this is the geopolitical geographic uh, formation that Paulus Davis mentioned. The main economies and powers of the continent and regions of the world, including Russia, India, Brazil, the emerging countries. So what is the role of the G20, uh, actually, sorry, the G7, starting from the period when the G20 came into scene, the G7 also requests to have some main role. And now again, the G7 loses focus from the in international media because the G20 takes over this position. So the G7 is somewhat uh, purposeless, but it's still a space for coordination among the allied countries that have that same 
values. So they say, let's maintain this group because we defend freedom and we are democracies. We know that it's not only that. There's a lot of, uh, there's all uh, about the economic values. They want to, to stay there. And now the G20, and they include Russia. So the G they also want to contain China and its military expansion as well as Russia. And the Brexit and the Trump presidency provided more uh, highlight. They emphasized all that. And then, and Paulo, you forgot where the the G20, and I don't think you remember where the G7 summit was in 2020. For a special reason, there was no G7 summit and we, in 2020. And we know that the Trump government was not cooperative with the international system. There were some uh, collision with China because they were denying the pandemic and all that. The 2020 summit would be held in the U.S. It didn't happen. It was postponed because of the pandemic, so it had to be postponed. And it was supposed to be a virtual global summit, but it didn't even happen. There was no G7 summit in 2020, so there was no response action by the G7 with regards to the pandemic. In And then... With the uh, Biden government, there is more cooperation in the global health scenario. And then the United Kingdom summit in Cornwall, like Paulus Davis mentioned, the global summit of the G20 with the European Union, with the WHO. There was a meeting with the financial international agents agencies and that they needed to accelerate global immunization. They would need 11 million dose, vaccine doses, and that those goals of vaccinating 50%, then 80%. And in spite of that expectation, what they could offer now in 2021, second year of the pandemic, to donate, to invest, and to support countries that were still lacking immunization and appropriate healthcare systems to face the pandemic, there was actually some frustration. And the G7 leaders, they promised uh, all those vaccines and direct donation. They couldn't, but they said they would support the WHO initiatives, ECOVAC, the main uh, donors for these initiatives, but they did not support the proposal from India and South Africa either to suspend the patents, to make it easier for vaccines and other healthcare inputs to be produced to face the pandemic. Instead, they said they would continue to support voluntary licenses and mechanisms to uh, support the pandemic, but they could not do it, as we can see. And the German presidency in 2022, now we are in this current year, and with the new go uh, German government, he, it brings already a proposal on the on climate, climate change, and a top-down proposal that they would, they would begin a climate club starting from the G7. The, and the countries that entered this climate club would have facilitation in the use of resources. They had uh, also a system of CO2 reduction and the CO2 co uh, credits that was adopted. This is why they created the, this club in the beginning of the French, the, the German, excuse me, new government. And the first ministries of health proposed to do away with the pandemic in 2022 to fight against antimicrobial resistance, which is a historical topic since 2020, since the year 
2020, like Pauli Davis said, and to approach the relationship between climate change and health. This important uh, relationship. And between January and February of that year, G7 was already giving warnings and threatening Russia because Russia was already giving signs of the invasion of the U of Ukraine. So the G7 predicted that there would be very strong economic consequences if that happened after the invasion. The G7 began one of the most aligned uh, forums in the to position themselves regarding the economic sanctions against the Russian economy, the Russian Federation. One thing that's also tackled by the G7 and the world as a whole, and we see comments and, and declarations by the G7 and G20, they are very similar. We have a larger amount of countries participating in the G7, but the topics are repeated, which is interesting. And the food safety, food security was approached. Health in the in Ukraine has also been uh, discussed. We have a presidential meeting of the G7 in Berlin in May 2022 and they discussed the patents of COVID vaccines. They discussed it, but did not approve it. The health minister in Germany, Karl Otterbeck, said that the problem at that time would not be the absence of vaccines, but the use of vaccines by middle and low income countries. It was terrible. I don't know what context was that he, when, in which he said that, but it, it was a terrible declaration because we know this is not the problem on the contrary, but some countries in Europe and in the e in the West began to say that when they when they began to push uh, vaccine doses that were close to the to ex the expiration date for these countries. Well, one important thing that we should need to say, but because we have lived all these denials about the pandemic. Uh, they required transparency and scientific evidence. Now we have the clear need for the prevention and preparedness of pandemics, which is in the agenda of the ministers of health. Just like the G20, the G7 is a space for coordination. Like Paulo Esteves said, it's not a big coordination space, but there is an expectation that it be a space that will adopt measures and will have concrete commitments to solve, to try to solve crises. If they managed to deal better with certain crises in the past, especially in the 2007, 2008 crisis, the rich countries said, let us save the banks. And they placed billions of, uh, a lot of money from the public banks and they saved the banks. But in the pandemic, we don't see this, uh, all these, all these, all this money to save the healthcare crisis. To say, we see that for the financial institutions, but not to have a better worldwide situation. We don't agree with that, but we know it's very difficult for these countries to make available their their financial budget. Uh, for foreign cooperation. We also have here the topic of increasing local production capacities and sustainable regional capacities in countries, in developing countries. It has been mentioned as important for these countries. And that includes the production structures. They understand that there must be local production, especially in Latin America, Africa, and the Oceania countries, because at a time of crisis, you need to have some positions in those regions as well. The G7 summit took place in Germany between uh, the 26th and the 28th of June, and the commitment signed was exactly, the agreement signed was on the following topics, sustainable development, inclusive economic recovery, global health architecture, foreign policies, and safety policies, gender equality, and digital digitalization. 
One of the things that came out, the launching of Global Infrastructure Partnership. This was the highlight of the El Mao Summit. It's a robust commitment in terms of financing, but it's not exactly like that. Like $600,000 will be included in the global infrastructure. It sounded like something very good. I believe we have a microphone that is open, but let us continue. And this five-year mobilization up to 2027 is a mobilization of public and private resources from several sources. And it's a financing, it's, it's not a grant, it's a financing. So what called our attention, this is what called our attention in the El Mao Summit. And in terms of concrete projects, and we're still far away from uh, reaching the promised percentages, but these are the concrete highlights. A contract with the Angola government of $2 billion, $3 million for the installation of a large plan for the production of multiple vaccines in Senegal, $600 million for the construction of a submarine cable for telecommunications. And we noticed that there is a geopolitical role in the sense that it will compete with China, which had had an important role in the support for uh, developing countries. G7 tries to gain space and to be a soft power given this alignment of the developing countries and their position regarding Russia. We've seen that the intermediary countries, Brazil, Indonesia, India, China, were not aligned with the West in the Russian condemnation, so to speak. And this could have been one of the reasons for this initiative. The G7 in 2022 had a main role, geopolitically and financially speaking, in the systematic opposition to the Russian invasion to Ukraine. And in the global health field, there was a lot of uh, rhetoric, little help in practice, and uh, all countries during the pandemic took care to, uh, of ensuring their own stocks of vaccine for their own countries. Even in Europe, there was difficulty. And when there were vaccines, uh, there was a surplus of vaccines, then they could donate and support other countries. So looking ahead, we try to see whether this infrastructure initiative will really be significant to the support, I mean, to restructure healthcare systems, but we still have some safeguards with regards to that. And now I close my talk with the last photo from the El Mao summit. Boris Johnson is waving. He didn't know yet, but he was saying goodbye to his own government because he was no longer there, not long after that. So I'm closing. Thank you. Pedro, obviously this picture has the Italian who said goodbye and he was replaced by Meloni the, from the extreme right wing. I also think, Pedro, that your presentation shows that the chapter for next year's book is ready. All you have to do is put it on paper. But in any case, I would like to leave you with a question. How much is the G7 uh, articulating, as far as you know, to operate within the G20? And number two, as you well said, the Bavarian Alps meeting was dominated because it happened. It took place in a very critical time during the war. But to what extent a real summit, that is that the El Mao summit in Germany, I think it took place soon after or 
right before, I'm, I'm not sure, but to what extent the results of the uh, health summit of the G7 can generate some agenda for a concrete intervention in the positions and a concrete actions of the G7. And I leave a question to Paulo also because we'll have a debate later. A question about the G20. He said that this will depend on the, the options once the southern circuit takes place in Indonesia, Brazil, etc. But to what extent, Paulo, will health grow within the G20 agenda? To what extent will it be able to grow? Because everything is indicating that the extension of this pandemic is not uh, easing because the different variants are coming up, but also because conditions that allow for the pandemic have not changed. The biodiversity issue, the climate issue, I don't know to what extent this this front uh, formed by the Democratic Republic of Congo and Brazil and Indonesia, to what extent can this uh, act on these different viruses that are still coming up, also the Ebola? I will leave you with these two questions and I will now introduce Claudia Hoyrish, who has been participating with us for a long time, studying BRICS. Claudia has published different articles together with our José Roberto. I remember the about the different, about the first BRICS summits. And Claudia will talk to us about BRICS, the trajectory of the BRICS uh, countries, and what perspective do you see, uh, she sees in this scenario. Claudia, you have the floor for 15 minutes. Good morning. I'll be talking about health and BRICS. What are they? Why do they have a different structure? The main objectives of the group, the main objectives of the pro temporary presidency, which is China, and the achievements in the financial monetary fields, and also health. Well, BRICS, a slide, BRICS in a, an informal association made up of five countries, the forum format levels of all participating countries as developing countries, and it's the most able to tackle quick changes in the international scenario. So, memorandum of understanding, are signed and letters of intentions are signed and they are non-binding declarations. Before South Africa joined, perceiving that, could, could we have the first slide, please? Well, BRICS before South Africa joined, seeing that, so they encouraged the creation of a different structure where their voice and interests would be taken into account. They were concerned with the negative influence of unilateralism, the USA, which among other attitudes used IMF and the World Bank to intervene in issues related to developing countries. BRICS countries are against the absolute domination of US dollar and have a positive prospect regarding de-dollarization of the world economy. They desire to have good political and economic relationship with Washington and to overcome the North American influence in world affairs. They established a system of world economic governance that is independent by creating a new developing ranking. And it reserves as... And a safeguard to winning of the SWIFT, which is the financial telecommunication system between banks, the Bank of Russia 
created a global system for financial messages. The initiatives by BRICS have tried to break the ability of the USA to damage developing countries and their opponents, both financially and economically. Could you please forward to the next slide? Please say next. Well, you have the slide number two there. The main priorities of the group are respecting international law, defending the key role played by the UN in promoting international cooperation, establishment of a multipolar world order that is more democratic and fairer to assume the commitments of multilateral diplomacy led by the UN and promoting development regarding the expansion of the group. They support the promotion of discussions among member groups in order to enhance the role of emerging countries and developing countries and world governance. This year, the foreign affairs ministers invited the foreign affairs uh, Minister of Senegal, Thailand, Argentina, United Emirates, Arabs, among other countries, to a meeting of the group. New discussions will follow to clarify what are the guiding principles and the processes for this process to expand the group. The value of the BRICS paradigm is more in a qualitative change in the global self development framework than the ambition of the country's BRICS conceived BRICS plus and outreach models to have a dialogue with regional integration associations and developing countries organization and emerging uh, markets to advocate commitments for cooperation and development in their regions and with other members of the South with similar ideas. They use the forum to advance in agendas that go would find more resistance regarding the classical multilateral agreements. And still on the main achievements of the group in the financial arena, they have the BRICS Bank, which will gather or mobilize resources for infrastructure and sustainable development projects that contribute to the growth of the countries that are members of the groups. The BRICS Bank provides, it is an alternative to the World Bank. From the beginning of the activities of the bank in 2015, it's approved around 30 billion US dollars in investments. And between this year and 2026, it shall provide additional 30 billion US dollars. Last year, it received as new members, the United Arab Emirates, Uruguay, Bangladesh, and Egypt, expanding the reach to more emerging markets. Brazil, for example, received resources for the payment of the emergency payment during the COVID-19 pandemic, and also resources for irrigation and sanitation projects, educational infrastructure, urban mobility, and development of alternative energies, as for example, uh, solar energy complex and wind farms. It also created the contingent reserve arrangement to help countries that are on balance, payment balance uh, crisis as an alternative to IM, IMF. In the monetary field, the group is exploring the establishment of a new reserve currency based on a BRICS country currency basket. And this reserve currency should rival US dollar, euro, and the special well, this detachment has been happening for some time. A proof of that, that Russia, China, and India have been buying gold, and Russia has been decreasing investments in U.S. Treasury uh, securities. Well, this new currency, R5 or R5+, plus, was based on the first letter of the BRICS countries' currencies, real, rubble, rupiah, and so on and so forth. And this new BRICS currency could play the role of an accounting unit to facilitate transactions in local currencies. And in the long term, BRICS R5 currency could play the role of liquidation or reserve for central banks of the emerging markets. 
regarding priorities of this group in terms of global health and of the current presidency in the area of global health, the main areas are management of the COVID-19 pandemic and vaccination, including genome sequencing, operationalization of the BRIC Center for Vaccine Research and Development in global health, antimicrobial resistance, TB, and the group has already a research network on TB, pharmaceutical cooperation, and traditional medicine. In collaboration in science, technology, and innovation, the areas of interest are biotechnology, biomedicine, human health, and neurosciences. As pro temporary president in 2022, China has, is focusing on promoting high quality partnership, opening a new era for global development. And it's been focusing on five areas, fight against the pandemic, accelerating the implementation of the 2030 agenda of the UN for sustainable development, and also practice of multilateralism. Now, I'd like to look back why BRICS countries why don't the five of them work at this together at the same time? Why do we have more uh, bilateral cooperation, for example? Well, first, we have the Ukraine war. And the EU. So we have Russia in this war. So Russia is having some sanctions. There's a conflict between the US and China where tensions have been uh, escalating, and this has become more serious when Nancy Pelosi visit Taiwan. Now we have more sanctions by the White House blocking the access of China to latest technology chips, and also more aggressive speeches of high military and diplomats ranks in Washington on a possible uh, invasion of China into Taiwan regarding USA, uh, Germany and France. The US has been tackling international and domestic challenges. Biden's popularity has plummeted. North American economy is not growing uh, a lot with a forecast of a growth less than 2% this year and 0% growth next year and also high inflation rates, 7 to 8%. The bet of the U.S. to uh, head NATO to weaken Russia with military and economic signs of uh, support to Ukraine is going down. France and Germany may face economic crisis because of increase in prices of energy and food. And there's some discomfort regarding the French population and German population. The head of the Pentagon has stated that Ukraine has very slim chances of winning this war and is suggesting now a political solution to the war. There is also a crisis between China and India for territory disputes. The two main allies of the USA outside NATO, which is Saudi Arabia and India, have well, have been closer to Russia. Riyadh and Moscow will decrease oil production, while Biden has been asking for an increase in oil production so that oil prices go down. People in Saudi Arabia wanted to join BRICS and to close. The Indian and Russian foreign affairs ministers made deals for joint production of weapons and arms. And India is the second largest buyer of Russian oil after China. So we have all these things going on right now in terms of geopolitics. And then we can now better understand what are the achievements in global health. Why do they happen between two countries or three countries or four countries? One of the commitments by the BRICS countries was cooperation in research, development, and innovation in biopharmaceutics in the form of clusters to mitigate the deficit during the pandemic. China, an Indian institute, exported doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine to Brazil. Brazil produces active pharmaceutical input. 
AstraZeneca, 100% national and may export it to Latin American countries. Russia signed agreements with Chinese companies to produce Sputnik V vaccine in India ordered Sputnik V vaccine and manufactured it to meet uh, domestic needs and also exported it. South Africa, they could recreate this uh, technology for messenger RNA vaccine and is a South African hub and they intend to do technology transfer to low and middle income countries. Bill Manguinhos in Brazil is working with Afingen to apply messenger RNA vaccine and update its labs. So BRICS countries cooperated in clusters, did technology transfer, export a vaccine, did technology development among the member states. They produced these inputs which are required to produce vaccine to speed up vaccine production and facilitate exports to BRICS countries and also to other developing countries. And the group worked as a block in the establishment of a BRICS Center for Development and Research in Vaccine, a virtual cluster which was which started in March this year. And Bill Manguinhos from Brazil is part of it. Then they had a symposium on cooperation in vaccines, and all of them talked about their strengths, weaknesses, what were their skills in terms of vaccine production. Still, in terms of achievements in global health, Indian, Chinese, Russian, Brazilian researchers are doing the genome sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 virus in order to identify gene mutations and viral recombinations. The studies on epidemiology to help assess the distribution and mathematical modeling of the pandemic to make future projections of the spread of the disease. The study will provide a shared platform to share and analyze data from the four countries and understand the routes of spread and how virus is transmitted. Phil Cruz is part of that through its respiratory uh, lab. In the Delhi Declaration last year, they reaffirmed the commitment to support countries to fight the pandemic through funding, donation, local production, and facilitating export of vaccines, treatment diagnosis, and they praised the contribution given by BRICS countries in supplying vaccine, including subsidies, donations for international organizations, and for the access, a global access of vaccines, which is the COVAX mechanism. Until December 31st, 2021, 11 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccine were globally made, and China was responsible for 5 billion doses, India for 1.6 billion doses, EU, UK were responsible for the production of 2.6 billion doses, and the USA for 1 billion. Until July this year, India had delivered 240 million doses to 101 uh, countries and UN entities, including subventions, sales, and COVAX. Until October this year, China had supplied over 2 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines to over 120 countries and international organizations. And 320 million doses were donated. China exported coronavirus to South Africa and India, AstraZeneca to Brazil. China sent coronavirus to Africa through the COVAX initiative. And in May last year, Russia delivered to India nine tons of medical supplies, including O2 ventilators, 225 flasks of remdesivir, which is used to treat patients who are hospitalized and who develop more serious symptoms after COVID. BRICS also committed to increase cooperation in res joint response against diseases, especially TB. In September this year, they opened in China the Center for Innovation in Cardiovascular Health of the BRICS, which was established to uh, focus on the diseases that kill more people in the world. In the opening ceremony, they signed a letter of intention with a Indian hospital, Apollo Hospitals Group, 
for innovation in medical technology, training of human resources, academic exchange, and smart hospital. BRICS also opened a public call on a framework program on science, technology, and innovation for cooperation in antimicrobial resistant projects so that at least three BRICS countries participated to conduct research on diagnosis and new antibiotics to fight bacterial infections and resistance, including TB. Regarding future challenges, right now, when the world economy has been harshly hit by the pandemic, where protectionism is gaining force, economic globalization is going back and liberalization of trade is being impacted, some countries are breaking the supply chain, further increasing the, 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 the development disparity between North and South. And we also have risks of food crisis, energy crisis, and financial crisis. And all this impacts the implementation of the 2030 Agenda of the UN for Sustainable Development. Well, China, well, one day after the BRICS summit, China held a meeting with many foreign affairs ministers proposing to speed up the implementation of the 2020 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So this initiative is the global development proposed by China and supported by other BRICS countries in June this year will catalyze the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and will open up more space for cooperation so that we have a fairer global governance. China launched this year a global development report and presented recommendations for policies in seven different areas for the implementation of the 2030 agenda in areas such as poverty reduction, food security, protection of human health, funding for the sustainable development, among others, and will also launch other reports to follow this initiative. China has updated its South South Cooperation Fund for a Global Development Fund and South South Cooperation has promised to add one billion US dollars to the fund in addition to the already three billion US dollars they have already promised. To conclude, I have some remarks. BRICS is a single grouping present in all the main regions and continents of the developing world. Three. G20 leaders are the three BRICS, Russia, China, and India. And now Brazil, with Lula as president, will be added to the group. Uh, the U.S., well, provided that it does not get in, sho in uh, shock with other countries, the BRICS, the groups have the freedom to exchange ideas, even though they diverge in certain things. The conflict U.S.-Russia and U.S.-China, China and India also is something that has weakened the group and the fact that India and Brazil now will have a more smooth, so to speak, relationship with the U.S. Uh, this is the configuration in this group. BRICS serves as a platform to expand South-South cooperation and has integration in different areas. Delays in global vaccination may cost to the world economy $2.3 trillion between 2022 and 2025. The emerging economies will pay for two-thirds of these costs, 66%. BRICS helped lose human lives and reduce economic losses by means of collaboration in clusters, uh, intra-BRIC collaboration in clusters. It also cooperated commercially and donated doses to third world countries. And up until December 2021, it had distributed 2 billion doses of vaccine for the developing world, including uh, subsidies and donations, bilateral ones for the international organizations and COVAX, by means of the COVAX WHO mechanism. It has improved infrastructure and sustainable development in the healthcare field. They 
the countries cooperate among themselves, also in the genomic sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 to identify genetic mutations. They launched a vaccine, BRICS, uh, a BRICS vaccine center. They inaugurated the Cardiovascular Health Innovation Center and the quality innovation and cooperation in projects about microbial antimicrobial resistance. This is what I had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. I also think that your presentation gives us a scenario that is very clear about what's going on in the BRICS. And this highlight that you provide is extremely important. I, uh, I think that the strategy of the BRICS, that they all act as, uh, together, the f all five together, but the bi and trilateral cooperation is very important, uh, as well as from other countries. And this idea that many countries should get into the BRICS and that BRICS has this expectation that other countries will uh, join them, everything you say is very rich. I learned a lot from your presentation, and I have many people following us in the different platforms and I share their uh, idea too when I say that we learned a lot. So our concern remains, our question, which I will leave to you, why don't they act as a group together and why don't they have a voice in the international fora? That is, they act. China is very active, politically speaking, and India, but we never see a common BRICS manifestation. The BRICS have co are coming here and uh, br uh, declaring this and this and that. To me, I'm curious about that. I I'm sure there is a political explanation for that. It's also very likely that BRICS has never proposed to act in uh, together in the international scene regarding the the WHO and they all wanting what South Africa in India claimed regarding the patents. Well, about Brazil, it's understandable. As you say very well in your presentation, the re-entry of Brazil, Brazil under a new management with a new president will have a different uh, position. But in your assessment, in your perception, why doesn't BRICS act as a group in the international scenario? Why don't they make collective declarations? Uh, is it because they don't have uniformity because of political reasons? Well, I will leave you with this question, this puzzle, and then you can maybe answer it to us. The Brazil that we imagine as being assertive in the, in the foreign policy is a Brazil that goes up to the Dilma presidency, former President Dilma. And also our vice president, Temer. Not to mention Bolsonaro, but anyway, let us bring. Regina will talk about another dimension. We spoke of the wealthy countries' blocks, G7, G20. Now we spoke. We heard about the about BRICS, but there is still a lot to be understood in them. But now we'll talk about the largest block of countries, but also a very heterogeneous block of block of countries. So why is this heterogeneity as it is? Well, you will, you will have an approach and give us recent updates. Everything Regina produces has a lot of information because there are many the things that are manifested by the G77. So you have up to 20 minutes and then we'll have Q&A. Regina, you have the floor. Thank you, Paulo.
Thank you for the present, the opportunity to present the background of these two groups of countries. And I thank everyone for watching. I will share my screen. Okay, we're good to go. In this extra advanced seminar, Paulo asks me to talk about the non-aligned movement created in 1961 and the G77 group created after 1964. And if I'm not mistaken, these two movements, these two groups were the first large groups of nations from different areas that were created. But let me contextualize first regarding the creation of these two groups. We know that in the 19th century and even, uh, well, after the 1950s and even before, because many countries became independent after the 1950s also, but until 1950, many countries from Africa and Asia were still European colonies. With the Second World War, when it ended, and with the destruction of Europe needing to be recovered, there was, it was a, uh, the ideal moment for these countries to mobilize themselves and to claim, to fight, to uh, conquer their independences. Just to give you an idea, up until 1960, there were 102 members of the UN, but during 1971, uh, in 1961, excuse me, and during the 15th General Assembly of the United Nations, 17 countries that were recently independent were accepted as new members of the United Nations. This was the beginning uh, of a change in the balance of forces in the United Nations with the inclusion of these less developed countries. And these countries which had this colonial heritage, they wanted to overcome and they fought to overcome this and be truly independent. They had a common interest, but they didn't, they didn't have any voice in the United Nations. And with the Cold War being at full force, they were, fought, they were, pre they, they were pushed to make a decision. Will you uh, support the U.S. or will you support the Soviet Union? Because they didn't want to align with anybody, they began to see the benefits of a mutual cooperation between them, and they began uh, to question not only the current economic relations system, but all of the cooperation system that existed in terms of power forces in the U.N. And we can say that this was... Uh, the background of the South-South collaboration. And then came the non-aligned movement group created in Belgrade. It was Yugoslavia then, now Serbia, who Brazil will play today in the World Cup, by the way. And this uh, reunion of countries, this uh, collision of countries, this coalition of countries that did not desire to align with the U.S. or the Soviet Union. They wanted to be, remain independent or neutral, and the creation of this movement of non-aligned countries was based on the principle of the Bandung Conference, which had taken place in 1955, which was regarded as the first large meeting, the first large uh, re, um event of countries to, who were no longer European colonies and who now, which now wanted to discuss ways to help themselves, to help each other mutually. But what's interesting is that the non-aligned movement group did not declare itself as um, an organization, but a movement, and they are still called as a movement to date. 
to let me remind us all that the Bandung Conference was the first big resistance movement of these recently independent countries who opposed to that traditional form of help, international help, among the developed countries and the less developed countries from the South. And this, and they, they really coined the term third world, which is an obsolete term now because there is no first, second or third world. Now we talk about developed countries and developing countries. But in the UN, this new group of countries was considered as a block, a third block, the Afro-Asian block. And this is an example that in this first meeting where the non-aligned movement group was created, there were only 24 countries participating, no country from Latin America. Actually, no, there was Cuba, which is in the Caribbean, but no country from Latin America was present because the U.S., want, they uh, made a huge effort for Latin America and uh, Central American Caribbean countries, which they considered to be their backyard. They didn't want them not to align. They wanted them to be aligned with their policy and be in their favor. Brazil at that time made a lot of effort, and it was a completely insane fight, I would say, because the U.S. was a much greater force and no other country wanted to to fight with the U.S. But the U.S. managed for Brazil, Bolivia and Ecuador to be present to attend this first meeting. The U.S. also sent an observer because they didn't want to be left out. But that's a whole different story. We don't have time to discuss it. And here are the five countries that were the founders of this non-aligned movement, who had also been the organizers of that Bandung meeting, as we saw. India, Ghana, Egypt, Indonesia, and Yugoslavia. These members, they had the idea, a very naive idea, of creating a mutual respect union and mutual cooperation among these developing countries. At that time, and perhaps up until now, the purpose of the non-aligned movement, I say up until now because the, the, the goal changed, the objective changed, but they are still firm in the idea of ensuring that countries be independent, that they be sovereign, that they maintain their territorial integrity and safety. Always fighting against colonialism, neocolonialism, racism, and all forms of foreign aggression. They've been fighting against that up until now. Every time there is an occupation, an invasion, they manifest themselves in a strong way against this movement, against this aggression. That is, against all forms of domination and interference ensuring the hegemony of countries. But actually, this movement was not uh, always uh, politically homogeneous because members vary. There were communist countries like Yugoslavia and Cuba. There were republics, uh, kingdoms, developing countries. So each of them had uh, their own agendas but they acted and what left them, what made them more uh, together or united was to maintain their independence without the need and the mandatory need to, to align with either the US or the Soviet Union, even though most of them were really, it was really aligned with the Soviet Union. They were always, uh, strengthened as a group, they kept accepting new members into their movement, but back in the late 1980s, early 1990s, with the, uh, when the, with the termination of the Berlin Wall, with the end of the Cold War, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, everything led to believe that this movement would become obsolete 
that it would no longer be relevant since the world was no longer bipolar. So in this new scenario, it was necessary to create international conditions that were favorable for the developing countries. So the focus, the purpose slightly changed. The idea now was for developing countries to be able to prosper and to thrive in this new environment, in this new power alliance. And in the year 2000, with the Millennium Summit, which was very important, we have, we still see the results of the Millennium Summit uh, unfolding today, like the Sustainable Development Goals, and which were then included in the, well, the, the I'm sorry, I, uh, Millennium Goals, and then now Sustainable Development Goals. So this movement was more geared towards the, the inequalities that they were seeing, and they began to invest more in social differences, economic differences, and even at that time in health issues. When we think about AIDS, HIV AIDS, which was a health crisis that mobilized the whole world. Everyone was talking about HIV AIDS and it was included in the Millennium Goals. Now we can see a portrait of this non-aligned movement. Nowadays, they are 120 developing countries and developed countries. And it's the greatest coalition of countries after the UN, they comprise more than half of the world population, and they have 18. There are 18 countries and 10 organizations that have the status of observer, including Brazil. They are still not formally constituted, or they don't have a permanent secretariat. We know that by the end, by the end of next year, the presidency of the Non-Aligned Movement will go from Azerbaijan to. Uganda. Let's talk about the non-aligned movement and global health. In May of 2020, the pandemic had practically uh, just been declared by the OM by the WHO as a global health uh, crisis. Everyone was at home, so it was uh, they had they had an online meeting the topic of which was united against COVID, and the purpose was to contribute with global efforts to face the pandemic, and they wanted to offer a rapid assistance, rapid uh, health care to the countries, because these countries had been left behind. And as a result of the May meeting, they established a task force of its members as a response to COVID-19 to help each, them, each other mutually, and they created a database with the needs and requirements, both humanitarian and medical requirements that the member countries needed. And this database was used by the WHO and is still being used for them to, to capture the needs of these countries as best as possible. And <clears throat> late 2020, they called a special session. It's not always easy to call a special session of the UN General Assembly. And in this special assembly, where all member UN member countries attended, they declare their unconditional support to WHO to guarantee a response by the international community to the challenges being imposed upon the world by the COVID-19 pandemic. And until today, they have been emphasizing the importance of timely, equitative and universal access to vaccines by all countries and also inputs to fight COVID-19. And some of the previous speakers uh, have already touched on that, that developed countries 
bought, purchased vaccines because they could afford, they kept these vaccines to themselves at the expenses of developing countries that need vaccines as well. And many of these vaccines were thrown away, as we all know. And developing countries could not have access to them. But we know that until today, in spite of all efforts, the members of this movement still face huge challenges because there is an unequal distribution of vaccines and also medical inputs or supplies. The non-aligned movement reaffirm their position and whenever possible, they say that, that there is a need of social progress, there is a need of economic development of its members, and always pointing to the fact that these global challenges require a global response. And they reiterate their commitment to multilateralism with solidarity, their commitment to technology transfer, training of human resources, and training in healthcare with specific funding or financing for developing countries. And they have been advocating the strengthening of the three pillars of the UN, which is peace and security, which is something that is important, even though it is part of the charters, the world is not respecting it, development and human rights, which are, they are very strong in the Human Resources Council, all these things that are really key for the 2030 agenda. And this movement has always been fighting to defend peace, prosperity, and they have been working in order to achieve a equitative and inclusive world order. Now I'll talk about the G77 snapshot of the G77. Again, in the 1950s and 60s, the countries that had just joined the UN we started to understand, well, they started to express that they were not pleased, not only with the order being imposed in the UN at their expense, but also they were not pleased with the current economic system of the time. According to them, a new international trade policy or politics should be recreated. International trade policies that would favor development, leading to an expansion of trade among nations with similar development levels. That barriers should be reduced for the export of raw materials that they could export to industrialized countries. And Prices need to be stabilized. So they had raw materials that were sold almost without any taxes to developed countries. But when they needed those products, they had to pay very high prices. And they said, this is not possible. We are giving you raw materials and later we cannot get finished products at such a high prices. So this was what was going on at that time. In 1961, the General Assembly of the United Nations declared that the 1960s decade would be the UN decade for development. And thus, in the next year, a conference was held in Cairo to discuss the development, economic development issues of developing countries. Those who were there in command were developed countries, and among the least developed countries, they would say, no, we want to decide about these economic issues we face. We do not want any more just to get something from top down. So this conference, which was held in Cairo, was an attempt of these developing countries to try to coordinate their own international economic development policies 
within the UN. And that led to the first UNCTAD, the first UN conference on trade and development. This meeting had to be prepared on UN TAD 1. And during the preparation meetings, it became clear that there were many issues, many disagreements, things that developed countries thought were problems and the solutions they were proposing and what the developing countries considered to be problems and the solutions they had. There were 36 uh, countries attending these preparation meetings and 19 of them were developing countries and they presented a joint proposal, summing up what they thought were their needs, their visions, what they needed and what their aspirations were regarding UN uh, con this UN conference, and no agreement was reached. So no agreement could be reached. So the decision was made to take this, this proposal to the UN General Assembly. But when this was taken to the General Assembly for voting, the 75 developing countries at that time who were a member of the UN signed this document. So it kind of became clear that power adjustment, and when this UN conference opened, and that was in June 1964, two years after the Cairo preparation meeting, and after two years preparation for this first conference, it was considered as the first major North-South conference on economic development. I don't even know if they already used that term at that time, north-south. And the 75 countries created or established a coherent, cohesive block. And it was something really remarkable during that conference. They shared the same interests. They believed in union, solidarity, and they emerged as a much greater force at the end. And maybe as a response to what Paulo mentioned in the beginning, that we no longer see this union among developing countries. They just speak, but they have no active voice, actually. Developing countries are no longer able to impose what they want. But at that time, they really were strong. All their, their interests were all geared towards shared things. And at the end of this conference, and it took many weeks, at the end, a joint declaration of the 77 countries were issued. Well, in the beginning, so we had 75 con developing countries, including Australia and New Zealand, who got out of it, and then they signed this joint declaration. And this had some historical meaning, and it was mentioned in newspapers all over the world saying that this was the most important phenomenon after the war. And they thought that this group would control the whole economic policy in the UN. Of course, we know that, it, that it, this didn't happen. The developed countries did not let them to. But the impact of this declaration and the union of these 77 countries was so strong that UN CTAD that should be one single conference, in the end, became something that would be held on a regular basis. It started a new era in the area of trade and development in the UN. And in 2024, we will celebrate the sixth anniversary of the G77, and UN CTAD had and still plays a key role in supporting developing countries so that they have access and so that they have a voice to discuss the benefits of this globalized economy so that this globalized economy is fairer and more efficient. And that was the opportunity in 1964, that was the opportunity for these developing countries who were really happy with what they could achieve as a group to establish this G77 within U 
and so that they could express their concern regarding everything related to trade and development. So today, the G77 is made up of 134 members, 14 members more than the non-allied movement, and it's the biggest intergovernment organization of countries within the UN. China usually supports all positions taken by the group and all declarations are issued on behalf of G77 plus China, as I have been mentioning in all my reports. G77 has become the voice of the South in all relevant UN forums, and its mission is to allow Southern countries to come together promoting collective economic interests so that they can also increase their international ability to negotiate jointly within the UN system. If they, were, if they did that on their own, they wouldn't have the voice to do so. Now the G77 and the global health. Since the beginning of the pandemic, G77 and China have been highlighting in all its declarations, they have been saying that the world has been facing three major crises, which is the COVID-19 pandemic, economic downturn caused by the pandemic, and also climate change that are becoming fairly clear. So they don't miss a chance to uh, speak up regarding these three issues, and whenever possible, and whenever relevant, they have been stating that there is a reduced availability of vaccines to developing countries, and that there is a need to guarantee access to vaccines and supplies at affordable prices. They say that vaccines should become global public goods to help overcome pandemic so that countries can once again develop. And they have been saying that it's really important to strengthen health systems because without strong health systems, this will not be possible. And they want countries to be financially able and intellectually able to improve their health systems so that they can face all health issues and all health crises that we are experiencing and that they will experience in the future. To close, to reflect, we need to strengthen all social, economic, and environmental proposals in order to respond to the challenges posed by pandemic in all developing countries. This should be a global response based on multilateral cooperation, favoring partnerships and corporations, sharing good practices, encouraging digital transformation with access to education and dissemination of innovative social protection systems. And that we should invest to strengthen health systems, facilitating equitative access, not only to medical supplies, treatments, vaccines, for example, during the pandemic. <clears throat> now to close, a connection between these two groups, the non-aligned movement and the G77 and China. There's a partnership and cooperation between these two groups. They were established more or less at the same time, more or less by the same countries. So, better said, they share most of the member states and they have a common goal, which is the growth of these developing countries. But the focus is slightly different and the strength of the non-aligned movement and the strength of the G77 is in advocating and promoting their fundamental values and principles, supported by solidarity of its member states. And that's why they are still 
very relevant groups in the scenario we are experiencing today with different regional groups being established, groups that have interests, be it economic breaks, for example, because if you look from outside, we might wonder what are the interests really? What is the interest of these groups and other groups that are being established in the East, in Asia, there are many regional groups as well that are being established. They're creating or establishing their own interests, but the strength of these two main groups here, or these two big groups, they include member states from different parts of the world. Well, with that, I close so that we have some time for the Q&A session. Thank you very much once again for this opportunity. Well, I thank you, Regina. All presentations were delivered within the time we had. We started a little late. We will extend around 15 minutes because we started late. So now I will ask questions to you first, Paulo, then Pedro, the questions I asked you before. And then Claudia and you, I'd like you to answer your questions and then final remarks, starting with Paulo Stevis. Thank you. Sorry, my camera was off because the little one arrived here. Well, you asked me about the future of the global health agenda in the framework of the G20. I think that there are three elements that are key in this regard. The first of them is, as I mentioned, is the fact that we're going to have a South Circuit of South Presidency, which started with Indonesia, but which will have now the presidency by India and Brazil, and then the presidency will be with South Africa. I think that we have to test now the ability of these countries that when they are in the presidency of the G20, their ability to, dis to influence this agenda of discussion and the results of the summits. I think that an important issue I couldn't mention during my presentation is the fact that the presidency of Indonesia, when we look at G20, especially when we look at the Bali summit, we can think the following. Well, from the point of view of commitments regarding climate, commitments were pretty shy, timid, even though in the G20 there's a reference is made to damage. So the agreement that created this was also in G20, the reference is there. When we look at G20 in Bali, we think that the results are timid with regards to the climate, health, digitalization. That is, the results are pretty timid. This would be the conclusion of the G20 in Bali, which seems to me as a big mistake. The greatest outcome from the Bali G20, and I think we should uh, praise the Indonesia government, was the maintain, the very maintenance of the G20. It was not a simple meeting. The fact that the chiefs of state did not agree to, ha to take a photo is not something that is purely ceremonial. It's not trivial. The fact that Mafrov left in the middle of meetings is not something. And the fact that Avrov was in the meeting in which the president of Ukraine makes his speech in the G20 is not trivial either. It's a, it's a showcase of an effort from each party to maintain that space. 
And I think this was a big victory of the Indonesian diplomacy. We need to, to acknowledge that, and it's very important. It's also important to understand what this G20 table means. It's the only panel, the only table that can gather at the same time. Western countries and middle income countries from the East, the West, China, US, the US, that is, this is the only table that allows for this meeting of these countries, aside from the General Assembly. But this is the only table on which the decision-making process is more simplified. So the first data I'd like to raise is the very capability of the southern presidencies to influence this agenda. I think the Indonesian presidency is an example that is very uh, promising because it influenced on the success. A, a second element that I think is important, and that's why I think the health agenda will remain present, is the fact that we can no longer discuss anything with regards to development and financial stability if we discuss global uh, common, uh, global public goods. If as much as there is resistance, I think this topic is a topic that is on the table now, and our problem at this point is to finance uh, global public goods. Who pays for what? This is the core theme, and this to me seems a G seems to be a G20 theme by definition, because it has an impact on different areas, health, climate, environment, food security, but the its core is the financial aspect, the aspect of distribution. It is as if, and I will make a bad comparison, if we took the exceptional background that Regina just presented to us, it's as if we were going back to that meeting in 1964. Because what's at stake and what was at stake in 1964 was a differentiation between developed countries and developing countries, and the accountability of developed countries to finance the international world. This this is what was stated in 1964, market ac access, uh, all this process of differentiation, which originated in 1964, and if you want to go back even further in Bandung, all of this process that originated in that temporal space, it has to be revised at this time at this point this seems to be an unquestionable piece of data that some countries detached from this mass of developing countries and now they occupy the position of intermediary countries why because they claim that status brazil claims a status of intermediary countries and that's how it operates its foreign policies but if it operates this way and if it wants to have access to certain positions and decision-making decision positions, it also has to contribute internationally in a differentiated way, in a distinct way from the other countries. So I'm already now answering the third question, that the problem of global public goods will be a core topic in the G20, I think, a core theme, and I think it's an opportunity for the southern countries to uh, have their own agenda based on their own logic. It seems to me to be a that the, the center of the debate should be the distribution and the distributive issue. And at the same time, to do this, and that's my third point, to make this agenda be the G20 agenda and make it uh, thrive in terms of uh, producing solutions, it's important to untie this knot which was tied in 1964. When I heard Regina speak, it, I was, I felt like I was watching an old movie. The moment w in which the South North Foundation was, uh, North South situation was founded, it needs to be revised because we obviously no longer are part of the South like our other partners in the South, but we are not North either. 
And this is a, country, a problem that we must face. That is a new perspective of differentiation, and I insist on that, a new perspective of differentiation among countries. And I conclude by saying that it cannot be based on per capita GDP. We must abandon the idea of per capita GDP because it's not an economic development index. There is a host of uh, works that are being done. Our Uruguayan and Chilean colleagues must be must be complimented on what they created. They operate with a conception of development which that is much more complex and it even encompasses health as part of the indicators basket. And this concept that is much more complex allows for us to deal with differentiation in a more complex way. So what we have is a challenge, it seems to me at this point, and I am a professor who works in the cooperation for development, is exactly the fact that we must face this differentiation for these agendas to thrive. If we don't do that, I fear that the agendas will still be paralyzed. Thank you, Paulo. Excellent point of view, Paulo. And you have reminded us of this vital uh, thing, which is the global public goods. This topic of the global public goods is extremely important because the pandemic has imposed that we go back to this debate. Thank you very much for bringing it back into the discussion. And health is also a global public good. Certainly, you can be sure this will be part of the next advanced seminar that we will we will have. Pedro, you have your final minutes to make your final remarks and to uh, to comment on what I said. And I'm taking notes. Don't mind you. This seminar of yours is loading me with work. It's been very nice to participate and to hear my colleagues speak. Paulo uh, asked me two questions. First one is about the articulation of the G7 members in the G20 meetings. This happens. There is no official space for that, but members do articulate. They have some similar positions, but obviously not all positions are common. For example, in one uh, one dear topic to us, which is global health, the proposal of suspending patents, withholding patents during the COVID period, we have now a, by, a position by the Biden government, which is more favorable to the this withholding of patents. Uh, other countries said no, that uh, Country, companies must have their incentive and intellectual property must be protected. But overall, in the Bali meeting, they made a joint declaration of the G7 on the verge of the G20 meeting about Ukraine. The G7 representatives, always before they talk, they uh, condemn what happened in Ukraine and all the suffering that takes place that there and they did that again in this meeting condemning the the missile explosions which affected the the situation in ukraine with regard with regards to the world health summit which uh, took place in october in berlin it was not a g7 uh, movement or meeting but it was sponsored by some members of the g7 france uh, with the participation of the who Senegal was also invited uh, to represent the African Union. So it was a meeting that planned to gather the players of global health. It was somewhat academic as well. It also gathered the large companies in the health field, non-governmental organizations, the academia, countries, WHO to have discussions and to try to move forward and find solutions for world health. So the World Health Summit happens every two years and the G7 countries participated. I'm not sure if there is any big 
a novelty coming out in terms of decisions, but it's an important meeting for us to follow. It's a forum for discussions and to find solutions for the health problems. Now, my final remarks, I'd like to say and agree with what Paulo Esteves said with regards to how developing countries are distinct. Now, we don't have just one big South. It's been said also that in 2013, we already brought this proposal of common proposals, especially that were more distinct, especially in the environmental field, but also in the health field. Countries like Brazil, India, Indonesia, South Africa, China, don't even mention China, of course, but countries that have more resources, that have more capacity, Brazil, India, China, productive capacity of production capacity for the production of vaccines that they need to ever more contribute to global development and the scope of the sustainable development goals, which need to be met by 2030, and we are late already, we need to take a, an extreme turn so that we can be close to establishing, to, to meet, excuse me, the establishing established goals. And Brazil intends to host the climate summit next year. It might may be held in the Amazon, Amazon region and possibly the G20 meeting. So it all points at the fact that Brazil will probably have more of a main role and will be a main actor again in the global health and global health care. Thank you, Pedro, for your presentation. Thank you for your comments. I pass the floor to Regina immediately. No, excuse me. I'll pass the floor to Claudia, Claudia Hoyrich for her final remarks. And if you wish, obviously, to comment on the question I asked you. And then I'll pass the floor to Regina. Claudia. Well, in my opinion, they act as a block when they inaugurated this center and also when they requested a waiver for the vaccines and medications. Other than that, it's like, uh, like I said, like it is written on the declarations, cooperation is in clusters. Also, because there are some internal disputes between countries, some are, are have competencies and or skills in some health areas, and others don't. Thank you, Claudia, for your remarks. I now pass the floor to Regina for her final comments. Thank you, Paulo. While my colleagues were speaking, I was here reflecting on what I could say. I think that we cannot deny the fact that global changes today generate a very complex structure. And I also think that some developed countries would like to see the disintegration of these two groups, the, the non-aligned movement group and the G77 group. However, the United Nations and its actions have been intensifying the support to the Global South. They, they've been strengthening the UN office for this cooperation with the South. And, uh, the vice secretary spoke in the G20 that just finished in Bali, the G20 meeting, that during the pandemic, the southern countries supported each other mutually with vaccines, with training, with digital solutions, with technology transfer. So that cannot be ignored. Antonio Guterres, he's been saying that the world is more bipolar. It's not bipolar anymore, that it's multipolar. There are many challenges. It's time to share and listen to solutions from the global south that the south has a lot to co contribute with it's never taken into account in this scenario and so forth 
And also, there is no way we can reach a solution without what has always been said, without solving this social inequality that we experience. Therefore, it's time to take into account what the developing countries are saying. So it's in, so these fora, both the non-aligned movement and the G77, they have a collective identity, so they need to strengthen their goals and how these goals uh, fit with the current world changes. And I'd like to make a remark here, and I'm fearful to make this remark because Paulo will give me one more homework to do. Two weeks ago, I was in Cabo Verde to discuss health security, and somebody raised it finger and said, but Dr. Regina, what happens? Why don't we talk about the cooperation from the south to the north? You only speak about the south to south, the north to the south cooperation. So it's what I'm talking about. The south has a lot to offer and it needs to be heard. Thank you, Regina. Well, my friends, we are reaching the end of this seminar. We had two and a half hours of the best uh, sharing of knowledge possible. I always say at the end of these seminars that I, well, I can only take as a criterion myself when I learn from a seminar, and I must admit to you that it was a great pleasure and I added a lot to what I already know about health diplomacy. A lot of new things were said. Uh, the words of Paulo, Pedro, Claudia and Regina brought new things that I had not contemplated yet. I hope and I would say I am sure that to all those who watched us with attention the same impression remains that how much have you reflected, how much you have reflected about this burning topic, which is the large arena of international disputes, conflicts and convergences of interest among the country groups, how much things are not resolved and how much we are living in a world of insanity with some few moments of political sanity, I would say. Paulo surprised me and I agree with him after all that Indonesia did a good did good work. Paulo, that was not my early impression about the G20. It's one thing that I will incorporate to my own discourse right now. And we have all learned from you that they did do a good job. And I think you explained it quite clearly. I understood many things about the G7, which Pedro brought to us. Regina uh, reminded us of the history and also she made future uh, considerations that were very rich and the beautiful pictures that Regina included of Nasser, Sukarno, Chito that she brought to us in the slides, it was an enchantment to review this time of Cold War, but of a lot of hope when we talk about the non-aligned countries. But she also tells me how things have progressed and Claudia indeed made a deconstruction of the BRICS issues that was very rich. But I didn't, not that I didn't know it because she's always keeping us informed, but she structured it in a way that I was able to see also the very wealth and richness of the BRICS. And it is clear when we look at the proposals made by different countries, internationally or the connections, the bilateral agreements she showed. So thank you very much, Paulo Pedro, Regina and Claudia. That was a well-balanced seminar. Two 
top quality men into top quality women. And this uh, big nest of knowledge that is Chris on issues related to global health, I'd like to thank all those who attended this seminar right before the match that will be played by Brazil in the Soccer Cup. Wow. And also, importantly, very close to the match to be played by Portugal. Well, that's true. So thank you. I wish you all a great day, nice weekend, and the next seminar. Chris' seminar will be on the 30th next Wednesday from 11 to 1.30 p.m. We're going to have a seminar on health and the environment with representatives of COP26, COP27, COP15, people who were at the very heart of decisions and they accepted our invitation. It's going to be a very international meeting with the participation of the leaders of both COPs that accepted to be part of our Samuel Guto Gavon, Daniel Magalhães, people from PAHO and WHO talking about health and environment. It's going to be a great wrap up for this year in the area of low health and environment, which is something as key as the political issues we discussed today. But the background issue that is really key regarding what is going to happen with everything including the fate of our planet, these things will be discussed the next seminar, talking about health and environment. Next 30th, Wednesday from 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Brazilian time with simultaneous translation into Spanish and English. And you are invited. The last thing, as soon as we finish here, the meeting will be can be will be accessed will be available to everyone in our fuel cruise youtube channel i've checked it already it is being properly recorded you can spread the link so that people can watch it later greetings to you all dear speakers and i wish you all a great day